Welcome to the first ever episode of Her Voice, a show that highlights female game changers from across the Middle East. I'm your host, Kumada Ramanathan. Now on today's episode, we examine the rise of Middle Eastern models. We've seen women grace catwalks from Europe and North America, but with wealth in the Middle East growing faster than any other region of the world, business interest in targeting this demographic has also grown. We start the show off with one of the most famous women in the modeling industry right now, and that's Hana Ben Abdeslam. She's a Tunisian model who is now the face of Lancome. We hear about her struggles in establishing her career and her campaign to see modeling considered a legitimate profession across the Arab world. Also, we speak to her manager, Sophie Jalal, a businesswoman who has keen insight into how the modeling industry is growing across the Middle East region. You are the face of Lancome, the very first Arab model representing the brand. What does that mean to you? Oh, I'm very happy. I'm very honored to be uh, one uh, part of the Lancome family. And uh, it's been a lot for me. <laughs> you know, your roots, you've been very proud of. You are of Tunisian descent. Tell me, what does it mean to be a top model in Tunisia? Oh, wow, mm, top model in Tunisia? I think I am the first one. <laughs> Uh, and I'm very happy because, um, uh, okay, I'm very happy and also it's a responsibility because um, um, now I am a role model for this younger generation and I start to bring my experience from Europe to my country and also for the Arab, uh, Arab world. Does your cultural and religious background influence your career? For instance, the poses that you'll be standing in or the clothes that you're willing to wear? Even I am Muslim and Arab uh, mo uh, model, I grew up in a conservative family. And uh, it's the same like European model. Uh, and I have my principle, my principle and uh, the people respect this your family's reaction to your mm -hmm. modeling career. Tell me, how did they feel? In the beginning, it was not uh, easy for me because um, there is no uh, marketing in Tunisia. And to explain this to my brother, I do engineer. Uh, I study engineer. And uh, I go to tell my, my, my father, I won't stop this to do modeling. He, he will ask me, what's mean modeling? and uh, there is no um, uh, marketing in Tunisia and tell me what's the modeling mean. And also, I just, uh, I show when I am very young, I show a TV, reality, a TV show, and it was Jean-Paul Gaultier show. I start like this model, uh, what's really doing, I see the expression and how she work, work in the podium. Then, uh, uh, I feel um, I'm like him, you know, I'm tall and thin and say, okay, I want to be like him and it was very difficult. And my one day I show some um, in the TV, Lebanon um, TV show, it's about modeling. And I ask my, first my brother, I say, I want to participate in this uh, program. I say, okay, why not? So I need to con convince my, my mom and my, uh, my dad. Okay, no problem, because okay, my brother is open mind and he's an actor in, tu in Tunisia, that's why he wants to help me. And then I participate in this program and uh, I was the finalist. With also, this program helped me because my dad he can understand a little bit what's my fashion. Then um, I received some invitation in Lebanon to work there and I stayed just for one month and I Really, it's not my dream to be a commercial model. Back home, to my, uh, I st uh, studied again engineer. And at the same time, I, uh, I participate in fashion, small fashion week in Tunisia, festival design uh, emot. Um, and from there, I meet uh, with uh, my manager now, Sophie Galel. And uh, she helped me to convince my family to participate uh, and uh, with the big agency uh, in, uh, in Paris or in New York. And then I start to explain this. And now my dad really is very proud and very, um, and me, I'm very happy <laughs> to see this, uh, this um, 
résultat. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we've talked about your family, but you're on kind of this worldwide campaign where you really mm -hmm. want to see modeling treated as a legitimate profession mm -hmm. in Tunisia. Tell me, what are you going to do? How have you worked with the community to kind of change perceptions of this industry and arts and culture in general? Okay, first I want to explain for a young generation, like young girls who want to be model one day. Uh, in modeling, there is uh, different types of modeling. Uh, there is a high fashion model, and uh, commercial model and uh, showroom model and everyone can be model <laughs> if you want yeah if you put like different clothes and you do some style everyone will take picture for you because you have different uh, and i am part of the fashion high fashion model and from there uh, you can bring your image to to participate, like me now, I participate with the association YIDA, it's a youth and empowerment development association to help uh, young generation talent, like uh, designers, models, uh, dancers, to do some events in Tunisia, and then to, to push this uh, artist people to find the right way. Uh, no, that's mm -hmm. great. And what has the reaction been? Um, I'm very happy because um, before to participate the, uh, in this um, association, I received email in my website from uh, one girl who said, uh, please, uh, I want to ask you, it's really difficult to be model, how I can be model, and some question like this. I said, okay, we can, the idea of it's from this point, I cannot answer for everyone. It's better to put, uh, put in my website or on Facebook page, or also in um, with this association to share the idea and how bring this image and how we can find the the right. Sophie, my next question is for you. Why Hana? What did you see in her versus all of the other models that you scouted in the Middle East? <laughs> That's a good question. Actually, uh, I won't be able to describe it specifically. It was really an intuition. Within the first 10 minutes that um, I started speaking with her, I just, I already saw her as a star. She just had that something special. And I had asked her what her uh, aspirations are, what are her dreams, and she told me that she wanted to do the catwalk for Chanel and uh, feature <laughs> in Vogue. And for me, that seemed so attainable. It didn't seem so far-fetched. So I realized that with um, my know-how and her ambition and determination that uh, we would get there soon enough, and we did. That's great. Now, you really have kind of scouted girls from mm -hmm. across the region. Can you tell me a little bit about, first, the modeling industry in Tunisia and then other parts of the Middle East? Well, there isn't really a modeling industry in Tunisia, you can't call it that. Uh, there's some ca casting agencies and uh, production agencies that have more commercial models. So it's young children, uh, uh, older people, uh, very commercial type. Um, the same thing goes also for the rest of the Middle East. Uh, there are no high fashion model agency, modeling agencies there. So. Um, the agencies in Dubai, I found one in Qatar, I found one in, uh, in Bahrain. Those agencies who are called casting agencies or production agencies also offer commercial models and mostly they're Europeans. The models that couldn't make it or pierce the market in, in Europe or uh, in New York, uh, they can go to Dubai and they'll find some work. So uh, it's very, very primitive still. I mean, there's still a, a long way to go. And you don't find Arab models. The only place where you really find Arab models is in Lebanon. So Egyptian models, Algerian, Moroccan, they go to Lebanon because they're more or less a small commercial, you can consider developed uh, market. But uh, nothing in comparison to the international standards. So, For a woman like Hana, who may want to have a career, let's say five years down the road, do you see the industry changing, evolving to kind of cater to their ambition? To yes, work in absolutely. Fashion? And it is through Hana's career path 
and creating awareness of what modeling is and that it's a serious profession and not just a hobby uh, with her desire to bring back the knowledge that she obtained and the experience that she gained from the international market back to her country, back to the Middle East. And it is uh, through really uh, speaking and interviews and uh, describing the reality of the industry and how competitive it is and difficult it is, that uh, people's minds will start to shift and change and understand more. Also through her career, even for parents, for parents to see that uh, her, she comes from a conservative family, that uh, it was hard also for her family to, to uh, confide, I mean, give her, uh, give her, basically they gave her to me and told me, you know, we trust you, so this is like a big responsibility. And, um, and that you can do this uh, job, you can have a career choice in modeling, be respectable, have people respect your uh, principles. And so it is possible. This uh, perception that modeling is uh, uh, a bad business or so forth, it's not true if you don't want, I mean, any business can be bad and any business can be corrupt unless you choose not for it not to be for you and you impose your principles. Did she ever receive any sort of criticism from conservative elements for her willingness to have a, you know, an international career? Or? She does sometimes, very rarely. I mean, most, the most she really uh, receives congratulations and encouragement and support and they're all very proud of her and things like that. I mean, maybe you can consider one in 5,000 uh, fans may send, you know, some extremist, I mean, just a, a message or something like that and, you know, I always tell her, look how much, weigh the balance and look how many people are proud of you in the Middle East and, uh, and you find that everywhere anyway, these uh, strange people who don't, um, who are extreme. So no, I mean, it's, in general, really people are so proud of her and I'm very proud of her also, you know, we get uh, beautiful messages and support from everyone, whether it's abroad or in her country, I mean, Everybody's, you know, cheering on for her, and that's great. So how do modeling agencies perceive, you know, entering into the Middle Eastern market, given that there are, fluctu you know, mm -hmm. various elements? Well, um, there's, uh, there's a demand that's being created now for Middle Eastern mark, uh, models to, uh, f for the international agencies. Um, it's very difficult for them to you know, get access to it. So pe people like me, who introduce them to, to models, I know that they also scout. They send scouts to Lebanon and other parts of uh, the Middle East and Africa to look for Arab models. Um, but it's very difficult because it's not only to find a pretty face or the right measurements. It's a whole mindset and mentality in development. And um, as long as in the Middle East they're still not ready, I think it's very difficult for them to succeed uh, abroad. You know, uh, Hana, uh, she's the only model I manage. I have my, my other businesses, the business, um, uh, business development and marketing. But it's really hand in hand that we took this journey together and, you know, faced the obstacles together and tried to find solutions together. And so it's, uh, it's a new experience for her and for me. And we're, it's a learning process constantly. So I think b through her career and through breaking those barriers, maybe it will be easier for the ones who follow her because she could also give advice and she could give them guidance. So we'll see um, how that evolves. Hana, I'll give you the last word. What do you say to all your fans who want to know what's next for you? Hmm. Watch me and you will see. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a beautiful ending. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank Hana you. and Sophie, for Thank joining for me on the show. Us. Thank you. Welcome back to the show. We now hear from Dr. Tagreed Al Saraj, a research fellow at the University of London. She'll shed light on evolving cultural views of the modeling profession from across the Middle East. Dr. Tagreed Al Saraj, thank you so much for joining us on Her Voice. Let's get right into it. We're talking about modeling. Is it considered a legitimate profession across the Middle East? 
in the Middle East, it's too early to say that it's a legitimate profession to go into, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that most Arab uh, countries in the Middle East are uh, Muslim, and in Islam, it is not acceptable for it to be a model because uh, Islam calls for female modesty, and and, uh, uh, and then modeling is the opposite spectrum of modesty. Uh, so that is still not acceptable in the Middle East, uh, especially in the Muslim uh, countries. Now let's take a look at one woman's experience as a non-Muslim Middle Eastern model. Being in front of the lens is where model Samar Huri says she feels most comfortable. So with modeling is also in a way for me to portray my beauty for my parents. You know, I represent being Lebanese, being Congolese, and I'm proud of that. But modeling isn't a career she planned for. With a degree in biochemistry, her Lebanese father expected her to follow in the family tradition of working in medicine. I knew he felt I was going the wrong side. He felt that, how can you have a degree to do something like that? So it's like, you know, in Arabic, there's a term say "aib." You know, it's like, what, what about your future? You need to think about your future. Instead of walking the aisles of medical laboratories, she's now walking runways, modeling high-end and commercial fashion. She says the larger Middle Eastern community has been supportive of her career. But with an Arabic name, she's also faced culturally targeted hatred online. At this peak, she'd say, okay, nasty summer. Some of them would say, oh, hot summer. Some of them would say, cover yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself. Some of them would say, how can she wear a bay? And the next picture, she was bikini. She says she's been able to forge ahead because her career has a deeper meaning for her. At the height of conflict in Congo in the late 1990s, Samar, her father, and sisters fled to Lebanon. Her mother stayed behind to run the family business. Samar was 13 when she last saw her. Basically, I'm raising my voice internationally now because they're not mentioning my mom. She's never been reported missing, you know? So I'm here by myself raising my voice and hopefully someone out there will know where she is or what happened to her. It's a personal quest Samar says she'll never give up on. I do carry my mother feature and I do hope one day that I could recognize by her. Dr. Al Siraj, what do you think of the criticism she faced as a model? I think it comes to me as a no surprise that she would get this criticism. As I mentioned before, uh, if uh, she has an Arabic name, uh, which is entails, uh, as I, uh, that most Arab countries are Muslim, but we must differentiate that not, not all Muslims uh, are Arabs and not all Arabs are Muslims. So in this case, she is not a Muslim, but she has an Arabic name. So people are assuming uh, that she is a Muslim and that she's going against the religion of being modest and covering up and, and being uh, wearing a bikini or whatever clothes uh, that she chooses to be. That would be a problem and it comes as a no surprise. Uh, the culture is still uh, uh, in the Arab world. Most Arab countries, uh, the Islamic countries, are uh, Islam and the culture is intertwined. So there's still uh, restrictions of what the women can and cannot do, uh, especially when it comes to bearing her body uh, in public eyes. Uh, there are two kinds of modeling. Uh, there are one modeling as being done, and it's an accepted form, is that women model for women. Uh, and there's no public media coverage, so there's no pictures, there's no TV coverage. So there is no, no problem with that. Women are, uh, uh, are exhibiting clothes uh, for other women. But when it comes to women exhibiting clothes or being on the fashion runways for uh, public uh, eyes, then that comes as a problem. In, in the religion eyes, that is not acceptable because it is, it's not, uh, female modesty is not being uh, respected. So that is, uh, in, the, in the eyes of religion, it is not acceptable. But in the culture, some, uh, that is, that's a different issue. Uh, some countries uh, that are, I'm not, uh, some countries are okay with it, uh, but it all depends on the ruling parties, uh, the people's 
traditions and, and values and how strong they are uh, in their faith and, and how, how strong they are in, in, uh, in the practicing of the religion. So that is an individual thing that you, you have no control over. Uh, so that, I mean, uh, so if you, in, in her case, she's not a Muslim, but there's other, uh, uh, other um, uh, models have gone through the same thing. There's one model, uh, her name is uh, Huda. Uh, I won't. Uh, I won't say the last name, but uh, she is from uh, an Arab state, uh, the occupied uh, Palestinian uh, land, and she she is a model, but she is not a she's not a Muslim, but she is an Arab, uh, and uh, she was uh, photographed uh, of uh, wearing a bikini on the cover of one of the Arab magazine, a local Arab magazine. And uh, the media went frenzy with it because she was just wearing the bikini, although she was accepted as a model in that area. But uh, even then, uh, it, was, uh, it was too much for, for the culture as well because she is an Arab as, uh, at the end. Now, one of the major talking points around the Middle East is how the Arab Spring has created push pushes for change vis-a-vis -vis women's rights. Do you think that the political events that took place a couple of years ago have in any way influenced perceptions of the modeling industry? I, I don't think so. I think it's actually the opposite. Uh, the, if we were saying it, what kind of turn would it take, I would say it was going to take a turn into the right tilting towards the right, uh, because we see different uh, uh, political agendas and different uh, ruling parties and governing parties coming into uh, power. So in that case, I think there's, uh, for example, the Egypt with the Islamist uh, coming in. So I think, uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, I think that is going to even change and that would make, uh, would influence the rise of uh, more female Arab models coming into the picture. Now, some definitions of feminism in the Western world include this idea of celebrating your body and putting it on display. Is that idea in any way shared in the Middle Eastern world? It sounds like it wouldn't be. We, we stem from the religion, what, what we can and cannot do. And so from that, we know that females must be modest, uh, and, and especially in public. And so the... Yes, you are free, a woman is free to do whatever she wants, but to display the body, that is what we, uh, that's like we underline that with red, that it is something that comes to, you're pushing boundaries and you're, and, uh, and it becomes a sort of a taboo. That's very interesting. Uh, there's also an idea of that, um, like you said, feminist is coming from the West. Now, with that, we are, um, uh, those views are being penetrated into the Arab culture. Uh, and so we've seen now that uh, uh, things that, uh, uh, the, uh, for example, if we're taking fashion now, we're being bombarded with all these pictures and these uh, stereotypes. This is the actual beauty and this is what it should be. And that plays into the, the minds uh, and psychologically into the young generation. And that is the, mostly the, uh, the French hot couture uh, uh, brands are targeting towards the Middle East. They're, this is a, an area that has been not tapped into. And that's where basically the money is in, uh, as we're talking now, in the Middle East. The wealth is there. And so the rise of female, uh, Arab models, uh, I see it as, uh, as a continuation of what these fashion houses wanting to happen, is that people want to see pictures and open these magazines and see themselves, somebody close to them that they can identify to, wearing this uh, brand. And so I would go and buy this brand because based that I see myself in it. I could wear it because the features of this model is Arabic uh, as well as I. And so that is a, a that is wealth that has not been tapped to, and now it's beginning. And so before, the fashion industry was focusing on the American and European market. Now they're focusing on where the money is, and it's in the Middle East. Uh, and so that is bringing the shift 
of the models. I'm not saying that the models are good or bad or they're not beautiful enough. I'm sure we all have beauty in us in different forms and sizes. But I'm saying that that's one of the things that the fashion industry is tapping into. And that's why we'll see maybe in the near future the rise of more Arab uh, female models coming into, uh, into the picture. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you to all of my guests on today's show. We heard about one model's rise to the top of her profession. We also heard from others who face criticism from culturally conservative groups. While blanket acceptance of the modeling industry has yet to find its day across the Middle East, Dr. El Siraj revealed how views of the industry are slowly changing. Do you think modeling should be accepted as a legitimate career? Share your thoughts at Levant TV forward slash her voice. Have a great day.